welcome to public school. I that was awesome. We just showed you everybody who's about to be on the show, but I'm still I'm still going to introduce them with great fanfare. My name is Buddy Scalera, and I'm the founder of Comic Book School, an educational resource that helps you learn more about the craft and business of making comics. Tonight, I have two amazing guests, two people who have accomplished incredible amounts of work and have done incredible things in comic books, but not just in the past, in the current, in the present. They are doing such cool things. Um, last week, you met one of them and he did a script breakdown for us and it was probably one of the most useful educational resources we've ever had. And the second, is someone who I actually covered back when I was a journalist many, many years ago, and I followed his career through the years and uh, started buying his comic books. And uh, we connected all the dots. We've brought them together tonight for your educational benefit. So um, strap in. This is an extra long episode. We're going to go for almost 90 minutes. Um, but let me introduce our guests. I'm going to start uh, with Tom Pyre. Tom Pyre is an American comic book creator and editor. He is known for his 1999 revision of the Golden Age superhero Our Man, as well as his work on the Legion of Superheroes in the 1990s. An editor at DC Comics and Vertigo from 1987 to 1993, he served as an assistant editor on Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Pyre has also worked for Marvel Comics, Wildstorm, and Bongo Comics. And I'd like to add Valiant. With John Lehman, he wrote the 2000 and 2007 to 2009 Tech Jansen comic book based on Stephen Colbert's character. But Tom, he actually has an extra bio. I actually picked this up directly from the Ahoy Comics website. And since, uh, since we'll be talking a lot about Ahoy, I thought we would read it because it's kind of funny. This slope-shouldered industry veteran was a long-running writer on DC's Legion of Superheroes, a founding editor at their Vertigo imprint, and the proud writer of their worst-selling, award-losing series, Our Man. He has since written enough major characters to fill one of those hyper-populated superhero posters where you don't know who to look at first. Today, he happily writes and edits Ahoy Comics from his Ditko-esque office in downtown Syracuse, New York. Welcome to the show, Tom Pyre. Oh, thank you. there you go. Thank you, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to see you again. I uh, I was looking back. We'll we'll show a photo. Last time I saw you, I think it was the '90s. I think it was. I think it was. It was. That <laughs> valiant, valiant comic summit. Yeah. So live in history. So I'm really excited. We're going to be talking a little bit about Ahoy, but I do want to introduce our second guest, one of your collaborators. Jamal Eigel is an American writer, comic book illustrator, editor, and animation storyboard artist whose experiences have taken him all across the field of sequential arts. The 30-plus year industry veteran began his career at age 17 when his time at High School of Art and Design led him to a chance internship with DC Comics. Following his passion, Eigel studied at New York City School of Visual Arts, after which he would hone his talents in advertising agencies, small comic publishers, and even in the field of animation, contributing storyboards to series such as Max Steel and Roughnecks, Starship Troopers Chronicles with Sony Animation. Entering the world of mainstream comics with a four-issue run on the new Warriors for Marvel Comics, Jamal's detail-rich pencils would come to grace the pages of G.I. Joe, Iron Man, Spider-Man, and the Green Lantern. He's been a series mainstay for household DC Comics names such as Nightwing, Firestorm, Zatanna, and Supergirl. His run on Supergirl with fellow writer Sterling Gates is in particular credited as a major inspiration for the CW's 2015 Supergirl television series. A recipient of the 2011 Ink Pot Award for Outstanding Achievements in Comic Art, Jamal currently works in the world of independent comics, lending his talent and experience to titles such as the critically acclaimed miniseries Black and his creator-owned graphic novel series Molly Danger. Welcome to the show, Jamal. <laughs> Hello. So, it, it, it's been a long time. It's been a whole week since we've seen yes, you. Yes, it has. I'll tell you, Jamal, the feedback that we got from your uh, review of the script and, and, and the way you helped explore that, uh, that eight-page story was incredible. We, we, we're really grateful for that. And I think that uh, everyone learned a lot. And the student uh, in the follow-up interview said he was so 
happy and felt so privileged to have received that review from you. Oh, well, it was my pleasure. Absolutely. I was, I was happy to do it. And yeah, I, I, he sent me a very nice note. And yeah, you know, it, it, it was fun. I had a good time. Well, and since I'm reading off the screen and I like to do that, I'm going to do one more read because I want to introduce everybody to Ahoy Comics. Ahoy Comics debuted in the fall of 2018 with the bold premise for readers to expect more from its line of comic book magazines, featuring comic book stories, poetry, prose fiction, and cartoons. The independent Syracuse-based company is the brainchild of publisher Hart Seeley, an award-winning reporter whose humor and satire has appeared in the New York Times and on National Public Radio. Ahoy's editor-in-chief, Tom Pyre, is committed to publishing comics with a dark sense of humor with titles like the religious satire second coming and high heaven the superhero parodies the wrong earth and hashtag danger the sci-fi spoof captain ginger and the time tra travel tales planet of the nerds and broad's age boogie and of course the humor horror anthology series edgar Allan poe's sifter snifter of blood that was not easy to do <laughs> guys we're very excited to have you tom even though I read a quick bio of it, can you just give us your view as the editor of um, of Ahoy Comics? And then in a minute, we're going to just talk about your waves and where we are now in your waves. Sure. You mean like what, what we're trying to do with it, what it is? Yeah. Um, we want to do comics, or I think we do comics that are uh, uh, kind of adult, but they're not dirty. They're just, you know, a little, a little uh, they might bore a child perhaps, maybe not. But, um, and, uh, you know, I worked at Vertigo when it was started, and uh, that kind of comic always stayed with me, something larger than life, something that has, like, a different take on things than, you're, than you usually see. But the difference with Ahoy is um, uh, our comics always have to have a very strong sense of humor. Um, they can be anything from an outright comedy to just kind of funny on some level. But that's very important to us because uh, uh, we want to entertain, and you can't entertain if you're humorless. I feel. Well, I mean, I'm sure there were titles that had some humorous edge to it, but Vertigo wasn't exactly the imprint for humor. I mean, it, and that's it, that's where it came up. It had some very very smart comics with some very smart humor in them, but no, it was not. It was not known for like Pratt Falls and. Seltzer bottles. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, tell me a little bit about this um, this um, uh, publishing strategy that you were discussing, uh, where you had these waves. And I, I discovered you guys in the first wave. It showed up. Um, I had some. I'd seen um, something uh, come out as a press release. I saw Jamal's name, and then I asked my comic shop to pull it for me for the Wrong Earth, and I loved it. I I really cool. was just not. Knocked out. I thought it was one of the one of the best structured first issues I'd seen in a very long time. Like everything was perfect. Everything from the art to the story melded together and it grabbed me and it was worth my money and I subscribed. But tell me about the waves of the way you're publishing and where you guys are right now. Well, we are uh, what we call a wave is we, we basically put out uh, a group of mini series. And the ones that work out well will come back for like a second, third season and beyond. And so we'll publish them in groups and we call those groups waves. So we'll, uh, for six months, our lineup will be these four titles. And then for the next six months, it'll be these four different titles. And then some of the first group might come back. So I think right now we're publishing our fifth wave and uh, we have our sixth planned and we're starting to, bite our nails over the seventh one. <laughs> Jamal, you came in very, very early. How did you get approached to join the Ahoy team? Was it something that was percolating up uh, at, at pubs and uh, after cons? Uh, how, how did this, how did your involvement come about? No, actually, well, actually it came um, by kind of uh, happenstance almost. Uh, I, you know, where I live in Brooklyn, Stuart Moore actually lives pretty close to me in Brooklyn. And there's a pie shop a couple blocks away from my house that we both like to frequent. And I was walking by as he was walking in and we were catching up because we hadn't seen each other in a little bit. 
And he said, hey, you know, Tom Pyre has this project that he'd like to talk to you about. Would you be interested? And it's like, sure, I'd love to talk to Tom Pyre. Because Tom is like, I've been in this business for so long. Most people assume that I've met everybody or I know everybody. And I don't think I'd ever had the opportunity to even talk to Tom previous to that. So, no, I don't think so. Yeah. So just to have a conversation with Tom, because Tom is, you know, He's like he's on. A, he was on that bucket list of writers that, <laughs> that I'd always wanted to do something. Being a fan of his Legion and being a fan of Our Man and being, you know, just he was at the time he was doing this book called Captain Kid that uh, that I've been picking up with uh, Wilson with uh, Wilfredo Torres, which I was really digging. So it was just you know, there's another superhero with the title, it was sort of like a reverse Captain Marvel kind of thing, where it's this old guy who, you know, transforms and he becomes young and he's got powers, but there's like a time travel element and, you know. <laughs> I mean, so Tom gives me a call and he pitches me the wrong earth over the phone. And it's just like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I didn't like, you know, just from the basic premise, it's just like, it's it's one of those ideas where you're just like, that is brilliant. And I've never seen it done that way. And I want to do it. So, yeah, so that's 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 how we got started. Lucky for me, you wanted to do it because <laughs> you, you made it so much better. And I'm not just saying that. I mean, uh, thanks. it was Jamal came up with the dragonfly motif for the heroes. And it was Jamal. I don't know. You've done so much on this thing, and just to keep it straight and honest, and <laughs> make sure that the coloring is right. You know, just, uh, you're so involved in it, and that means so much to me. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's like I tell you, I whenever Tom and I talk, you know, I always remind him, you know, this is our project. We're in this together. We're, you know, it's as important to me as it is to him to have the best possible book. That you know we that we can put out there, so you know, it's I I like being a part of the process. I've always liked being a part of the process. You know, it, it's you know it, it's easy to compartmentalize yourself when you're just doing the pencils or just inking or whatever. But I like seeing all the stages. I like being involved in planning on things, and you know it's you know it's it's fun for me. You know the the, the editor. The, the former editor comes out, the former art director comes out. <laughs> so Tom, it, it, that sort of triggers a, a thought because you know we're, we are all about the craft and business. And then Jamal actually, let's do this, let's do this uh, starting with you, Jamal. Okay. What do you remember about the pitch that Tom gave you for the wrong earth that clicked for you that made you want to do it? And then Tom, I'll be asking you if you remember the exact way that you pitched Jamal, because I, I want our students to understand how these things come together, because you may have slightly different memories of it. Jamal, can you just talk about your memory of what the pitch was, what stuck out, what made you want to do it? Well, the, it wasn't even really so much the pitch itself. I mean, I was intrigued by the idea for the story, but I think it was realizing and talking to Tom that he and I have very similar senses of humor. So we, we, we clicked on that level. And then, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that Tom and I have in common. So, you know, it, it was just like, it was that getting to know you process also. But then when he pitched me the idea, because, well, first, the, the it was a weird period for me because this was right before I was about to leave for Japan. <laughs> so I had like, three weeks to kind of like we had three weeks while i was in japan like on emails like trading ideas back and forth for where for where we wanted to land and originally um there were going to be dog like related heroes and part of the reason i kind of was like there's a there's the reason why there's two reasons i didn't want to do the dog thing because a lot of other guys have done the dog hero mm -hmm. Thing. Um, especially my buddy Vito Del Sante has a book called Stray with like a dog theme oh, yeah. and I didn't want to step on his toes as well it's just like it's been 
you know, even with like the the old uh, New Heart TV show from like the the nineties, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they even had a dog themed vigilante hero on that show. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah. So while I was in, you know, while we were like talking out the idea and like the premise, like the premise was there. He says, "We got this hero." There's two versions of them. One is you know kind of, you know, 60s, you know, Biff Bam Pow, the other one's dark and gritty. And they swap universes. And I was just like, good. <laughs> <laughs> but while I was in Japan, and is this the right book? I think this is the right book. This is probably the right book. Huh. So this might be the right book. I think it is. No, this is the wrong book. I got a whole bunch of different moleskins around here. But oh wait, no, this is the right one. This is the right one. So this is the moleskin that I had with me in Japan. And Tom, and, is this the first time you've seen this? I think this is I, and this is literally the first sketch that I did. Wow. These are the first sketches that I did while I was in Japan. These belong in the Smithsonian. <laughs> So these are those are literally the first sketches I did. That's the very first That's sketch. Great. I did, what would ultimately become Dragonfly? It's pretty close. So yeah, so the whole Dragonfly idea actually came out of that trip. One of the things that I noticed um, while I was in Japan is they used dragonflies as part of a motif. Dragonfly in Japanese culture uh, is a symbol of strength. And gracefulness and, and embodies the warrior spirit. And I was telling Tom this, and he writes back, he's like, You know what uh, dragonflies are in European culture? They're like demon insects. They're, they call them like eye stickers. <laughs> so, and then he's like, boom, there we go. We got our hero. There we go. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. That's so thank thank you for sharing that, Jamal. That's pretty. That is pretty incredible. And we're going to be doing a follow up um, after this with uh, one of your with Tom script breaking it down in, in one of our upcoming episodes. But um, Tom, um, put you on the spot there. What what is the high concept, and what do you remember about? Um, pitching it, the idea to share it with Jamal again, because you guys hadn't worked together on anything. You didn't have a, a, a long time connection. You probably had to sell it in some way, right? Well, it pro I'd probably remember better if Jamal had put up any resistance at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't believe he did. And um, uh, I think I just, you know, I gave, I know what it was. We had a gag in the first issue that made you laugh the loudest, Jamal. And it was Whoa. that it was um, uh, Dragon when when Dragonfly Man, who's the uh, '60s Silver Age character, gets trapped on the like '80s oh, yeah. world um, of grim and grittiness. The first time he sees a policeman, he runs up to him and he gets <laughs> shot. <laughs> they just shoot him. <laughs> And then um, the way he got out of it, well, he's like laying there bleeding and stuff, and uh, right in the chest they got him. Oh, and the yeah. way he got out of it was that uh, we find out next issue that he he expected danger, and he thought to take one of his um, bullet antidote pills. Yeah, yeah see, he, the, he invented. The pro, it, it, it takes the 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 lead and transforms it into protein so and like a collagen so, to to plug up the wound. To, to heal the wound yeah <laughs> so i think that was the minute i really had jamal which oh yeah i told him about the anti-bullet pill <laughs> and so i always try to have something like that like um what was the one? How did he get out of the explosion, Jamal? Was there a spray? He had the, no, yes, he had the anti-explosion spray that he put on himself while he was before he went to rescue Jordan. He was in yeah. the back of the dragon wagon, and he's like spraying himself with this explosion. Anti-explosion of, of his own invention. Of his own invention. They're always of his own invention, <laughs> and he always mentions that. He really wants the credit for it. Um, he's uh, so. 
that was the thing. We just had funny stuff to laugh about, and yeah. Jamal added to it immensely. So give me the – once again, Tom, um, we, we were you know showing the art and everything. Give us the high concept uh, for people who are new readers or getting ready to jump onto the next wave. Okay. Um, if you ever read a comic published before the early 80s, you know that uh, superheroes back then were kind of flag saluting, helping old people across the street, kind of uh, buddies with the police, and just really upstanding people. And, uh, after, and then something really went wrong in the 80s, and they became these uh, <laughs> murderous vigilantes who want to stick it to the man. And so uh, and very often it's the same character, which really, I, that's what I was thinking about. If you grew up in a certain decade and you look at a character's chess symbol, it means one set of values to you. But if you grew up in a different decade, it might mean an entire different set of values entirely. So, uh, uh, you know, what used to mean service and bravery now becomes like bloody vengeance. And I'm not saying either one of these things is bad. It's all escapism and we love it. But um, so you've got the uh, Silver Age version, Dragonfly Man, who's a mass crime fighter, like many mass crime fighters. And there's one particular uh, comic book character that this always gets compared to. And I think that's very unfair because they were all like this. <laughs> but uh, I think you know who we mean. But uh, so... Uh, and then, then you have Dragonfly on the on the uh, really wicked, dangerous Earth, um, who's got to like be running from the police and everything. And they get uh, switched. They get switched in what I call a double Howard the Duck scenario. They're trapped on each other's worlds, and uh, uh, so they're both placed in these situations where even the good guys don't share their values. They've got nobody. And uh, just trying to make sense of the world, Dragonfly Man has to just live in this hellacious, almost post-apocalyptic. It's just pre-apocalyptic cityscape, you know. And and Dragonfly, Dragonfly has to live in this world where he can't take anyone seriously because they're all like, you know, marching in parades and. Uh, you know, the, the uh, 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 instead of like a police commissioner to report to, Dragonfly Man would go to the bank president. And he's like giving the orders. And so this is the kind of, it seems like so corrupt, but it's so innocent and sweet. He just doesn't know what to do. So he I think, just has to make sure that he, no one's watching when he murders someone. Yeah, I think what, what, what struck me were two things. One was uh, how effectively you and Jamal deconstructed what would be considered silver or even early silver age uh, superhero books and really incorporated into a modern aesthetic with that that juxtaposition and then how shocking and quick some of the action and violence was i mean it was as you said it's it's this is for an adult reader what what caught me a couple times was wow that was that was really fast and really the suddenness of it but and yet it seemed completely contextually consistent with what the two of you guys were building. It wasn't just shock for shock value. It was like you were building toward it. And I went totally logical. It wasn't a jump scare in a movie that didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It was actually something that was incredibly consistent. So as creators, how do you ensure that you build toward that moment um, and put all of those pieces in place so that you get to those moments that you want? Well, what you, what I think, I see it a lot on television, and I don't really like it. And what I, what I see a lot of people doing is thinking of something really cool, and then working backwards to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that's the backward way to do it. You've got to be with the characters and see where they're going, and you can nudge them into interesting and entertaining places, but you can't be like you know, deciding they have to be the people who who uh, experience this cool scene. Because then you're left with very arbitrary characters, if you follow me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, they, they are just pieces that you're moving on the board, yeah, right, yeah. to where you want to get. Now, you you guys, this was six issues, right, the first series? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and how much of that did you outline? Uh, Aaron, can we go to a three shot with the three of us? And so this, how how do you plan these out? Do you got do you uh, do you guys outline uh, a thumbnail storyline for each issue? Um, how do you guys do your plan, or do you write by the seat of your pants? I have a vague idea of where I want to. I have an idea of where I want to end up. And early in my career, I just was I just sat down planned everything out to the max and um, when I had once I had some experience I was able to loosen up a little and I think it made the work a lot better because there's something there's a uh, there's something that the wrong earth pivots on it's the fate of a particular character that we learn about in the middle of the series and it's the most important thing that happens in the series it's sort of um, it, it makes everything else happen and uh, I didn't think of it until I got to that panel. I was so lucky that I left that open because I didn't know what was going to be uh, the best thing to do until I had really been in the weeds with these characters for a couple of issues. If I sat there and tried to write an outline for the whole thing, I think it would have fallen a lot flatter than... than um, the way I was able to do it, but again, that comes with experience. You can't, you can't just sort of jump in that having written very many stories and think, well, I hope this one works out. Mm -hmm. Because speaking uh, of, speaking of Tom, how many? I, I, we were going through your bio. Approximately, how many comics have you written? I we were, I was trying to do a ref back, back of the envelope. It's somewhere over three hundred, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I don't know That's the number. That's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of issues. Jamal, you've drawn a, a heck of a lot of titles too. Did you ever do a count? Uh, I tried. <laughs> I tried. It's easy. It's. I would probably say over the course of my career, I think I've probably drawn somewhere in the area of like two thousand pages worth of worth. Wow. So, yeah, it, that's been a lot. That includes like. You know, eight pages here and there, that sort of thing. Not just full issues, but, you know, like full run, like full two-year runs on series. Like, you know, that that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's it's been a lot. You know, I've, I've done a lot. And then, you know, on top of, like, pinups and covers, you know, everything else. It's just, you know, it, it, it's hard to keep – it's hard to keep track. It used to be easier when comic book uh, database was up. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a, I had to piece it together. There's fandom pages for both of you. Yeah. Like there's a Marvel fandom page. There's a DC fandom page. There's in, there's a Valiant fandom page. So Tom, just uh, you you were saying something that was really interesting, and then I I interrupted you and broke your train of thought. So I I'm sure you appreciate that. Um, Please, it's your show. <laughs> what I was hoping to know more about, though, was as you're thinking about this, um, you know, you're working both as the editor and the writer. You're working with Jamal, who's also an editor and a writer. You did talk about leaving some space. What is your writing style? Like, how much do you put on the page? Uh, and then how much do you leave uh, for interpretation from for Jamal? Well, it, it definitely depends on who you're working with. If you're writing for someone who doesn't have that much experience, it's very helpful, I think, to them to just describe as much as you can and, and suggest, you know, things like uh, camera angles and stuff. But with, with Jamal, I don't have to do any of that. I let him do the work. <laughs> so, you know, my panel description is like, this guy punches that guy. No, but they're they're very complete scripts. I, you know, don't downplay it. There, all yeah. the information is there. You know, you're not like giving like camera directions and telling me I want a you know a, a mid level shot here and a close up here and you know unless it's something specific that Tom wants there. But the, the you know once I get the script from Tom, like my method of working is very very methodical. For, you know, from beginning to end. Like I, and Tom sees every stage as I'm working. I, I will send him the thumbnails. I will send him the layouts. I will send him the finished pencils if I'm doing a color, a cover. The same thing. He sees everything 
as I'm going along. So if there's anything that needs to be changed or something that needs to be moved, then you know we're all on the same page. And then the layout, I give him the layouts, and he has an idea of what to give to Troy to you know. And you know, so that Andy knows where where to. Sorry right. about that. <laughs> Alexa just answered you. <laughs> so you know what, and then you know, but again, you know, my you know my way of working is to have you know as much information on the page for the reader. I'm building a reality. It's not just about building a world and building a reality. And in the case of the wrong earth, I'm building two or three realities at the same time mm -hmm. and going back and referencing each one. You know, so I have like every issue has like, you know, depending on, you know, what's going on, giant files of reference for everything. For you know, for everything in Earth Alpha, Omega, and Zeta. So, and then you know, I'll show stuff to Tom that I'm that I find online and like I think is cool, and he'll find a way to slip it in somewhere. And you Absolutely. know, yeah, you know, that's that's collaboration, yeah. right? Yeah, that's, that's true collaboration. Well, this, this is one of the great collaborations I've ever experienced. It really is. It's you know, you were talking about. Um, how much to put into a script for the artist. And one time years ago, I, I wrote this script for um, Doom 2099. Mm -hmm. And it was a, uh, I didn't know who was gonna draw it, so I just made sure there was not gonna be any mistake about anything. And I wrote these fascistic uh, <laughs> panel descriptions that left nothing to the artist's imagination, you know, because I had no idea. There were a lot of people working at Marvel at that time who. I didn't have much experience, so they give the script to John Buscema. I was so <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I'm still embarrassed. It was like almost 30 years ago, and I, this humiliates me. <laughs> and he drew it, and he said, "I don't want to draw any more of these." <laughs> it was the one time I got to work with him. So let me just shift gears. Um, when you guys start out and you get your three, your first couple of waves, and now it looks like you've got the momentum and you've you've passed that hump of, you know, that first couple of years and you're going to have longevity. Our audience is our people who are hoping to break into comics, um, hoping to make their way up and um, either work on established properties or pitch new properties. Um, let's just start with um, recommended strategies uh, for people who want to break in, not specifically at For Ahoy, but just recommended strategies. And I'll ask both of you uh, the hard one, which is recommended strategies for writers. An artist, it's it's evident on the page. For writers, recommended strategies. Um, I'll start with you, Tom. Um, what's a what are what are publishers looking for? And you've worked for many publishers and edited at several. What are publishers looking for from writers? And also, you know, you could say remotely now or even at cons. However, you want to uh, start to address it. Well, number one is patience, because we really don't have time to read what you've sent us, and we try to eventually. But uh, usually we have a lot of work to do that involves getting the books out the door. Um, and it, I feel bad for writers, because they, um, it's, it's really easy, like you said, to look at a page of art. You know within seconds what you want to tell this person. And, but to have the time to sit down and read like a long script, it's uh, with long panel descriptions. It's it's really that really presents a great obstacle. The first time uh, somebody read one of my scripts and gave me a chance was I had sent it to DC and I just did I just made a little comic book with balloons and I didn't fuss over the drawing. It was just clear enough that uh, what was happening in the panel. And I had them talking in word balloons and I got a letter back 
somebody saying this was good. That was, but if I had typed out a long script, I think I would still be waiting to hear. Wait, um, you made like a mini comic of your own? I, I, I it was like a eight page Green Lantern story, and I just did it as a little mini comic, and um, uh, because I knew that it would be easy for them to read. And what were you showcasing? Your dialogue, your pacing? Is you were just hoping it was that they everything? Would... You know, I just did these like it wasn't the it was almost like layouts. You could tell who every character was, and I did have certain. I did do some certain things, like I had a couple big panels and stuff. It was the way I envisioned the story, and I just had you know the lettering and the word balloons, and uh, that was what got that was what got uh, a letter back for me from DC Comics something they could read easily. I have never heard of anybody ever doing that. I mean, I've heard a lot of interesting uh, approaches for writers. I have never heard of that. So, but how can a writer now today break through the noise or get something into your hands for consideration? Well, um, again, I, I think people have had success if, if, if they have something they can show you that someone's drawn. Um, because again, you don't have to sit. It, it's it's just a lot faster to read, mm -hmm. and that is a huge issue. That's a huge issue. Is an editor's time. There's never enough of it, and editors are never caught up, and they never have a, a day where they go, "Oh, I can just sit here and and uh, choose what I'm going to do." Because usually, you don't even get to choose what you're going to do because the calendar and the clock are telling you. And uh, so I, I, you know. You know, in one way, it's a lot easier because of the internet. You can put something up there that we can see. We can go look at it. In some ways, it's a lot harder because of the internet, because we're just uh, bombarded with stimulation. All the right. Time. So uh, there's no magic key. There's no magic bullet. I hope, you know, when we do get back to conventions, if you can become a person that an editor uh, thinks of and not in a bad way. <laughs> you don't want, you know, you know, you don't, you don't want them. Oh, that's the guy who like, will stop talking. Yeah. That's the guy who stands there and talks to me while people are trying to get autographs and they can't get to me. If you can f find positive ways, the guy who bought me a drink is a good one. <laughs> Let's be, yeah, I mean, let's be real. You you noticed and you have a positive memory reinforcement. It's not the worst it's strategy not, in the world. It's not the worst strategy. Yeah. I'm not saying bribe your way in, but I'm saying just find like, you know, find a way for them to think of you as a nice person who's not gonna give them a lot of trouble. And that that's that's worth a lot, I think. I, I, um, I agree. I think I was hired and I'm telling tales out of school, and I might even just be imagining this. Don't. But in my in my mythology, as I remember my own career, I got hired by Karen Berger, and we ended up. She started Vertigo, and I was one of the editors there. But I was hired as her assistant editor um, before we had Vertigo, and we were going to be sharing a small office. And I think a huge part of the reason I was hired was that. I didn't come across as an overbearing person to share an office with. <laughs> <laughs> I really believe that. Uh, so, we'll, but I could be wrong. But I, I think that stuff is important. I would agree. I would agree. I mean, a lot of people uh, undervalue likability as a, as an attribute of wanting to work with somebody. And mm -hmm. and speaking of likability, Jamal. Can you give us your impression of what writers can do to better position themselves to break in? Uh, and again, it doesn't have to be a hoy specifically, but break right. in. And, and, I, and I'm sure a lot of people come to you, and, and I'm, I, I, you can validate or devalidate this, where they want you to just draw their story. That, that happens a lot. I get approached a lot by uh, non-comics writers who have an idea for something that they want to turn into a comic book, but don't have the experience. Um, and then I have to politely explain to them that I have a very full schedule and uh -huh. 
But they'll split. The, but they'll split the money with you when it becomes oh, yeah. a movie. No, absolutely. They're, they're, yeah. they're, you There's know, be um, so much, so much back end money. <laughs> I'm still waiting for my goddamn movie check. I swear to God. <laughs> um, well, okay. Here's the thing, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that Tom said. Um, I think the probably the easiest way that I've seen for writers to get an editor's attention is, you know, Tom did the eight page comic, put out a comic. It doesn't have to be like a full color extravaganza, mm -hmm. put something together, do a Kickstarter for the print, you know, for the print run or any go go or something. But it's a leave behind. It's something you can leave behind with an editor, and frankly. That's the easiest way for an editor to be able to tell whether or not you know what you're doing, or at the very least, you're somebody who has the the bones of being a good comics writer, and I can work with you. I can I can shape you. I can mold you. I can help you along to get to that next step. I, there were so many instances of people. I know Kyle Higgins got in that way. Um, Tom King wrote his novel. Uh, under a once crowded sky, and that got a lot of people's attention. That's how I met Tom. Was you know he was hawking the novel at comic book conventions, like years and years ago. So you know before he started doing a Mega Man and all this other great stuff. Um, but that, but again, that seems to be to me, and it, and you know in terms of the internet, the same thing. Put a web comic out. You know, if you can do something on Taptastic, if you can do, do something on Webtoon, even if you're just hosting something on, you know, DeviantArt or ArtStation, something that you're putting together. I think that's how uh, Jamal Campbell got noticed as an artist, was he was doing his own independent stuff. Um, and people noticed it, and suddenly he's doing covers, and he's doing, you know, Far Sector over at DC, and Naomi, and all this other stuff. So, you know, I, one of the things is I... I try to tell people is that there are, you have so many more outlets for getting your work seen now than ever before. When I first got into the business, all you could do was go to conventions and send out photocopies to editors. And I would bombard editors with photocopies. I would, I had this one period where all I was doing was generating three to four pages of samples every week and then sending out like 50 copies to every editor that I knew. And most of them got ignored, but a few would come back. You know, a few would call me or send me a letter or and say, you well, you did this right, you did this right. But they were seeing uh, growth and they were seeing uh, progression. And then, you know, they would remember me Again, you know, they, were, they remember me or I see them at a convention and show them stuff at a convention. And eventually that got me hired. I mean, that's how I got my first DC work was I was doing work for Majestic Entertainment for those of us who mm. remember that fiasco. <laughs> but I took those pages, put them in an envelope sent them out and then Kevin Dooley, who was the editor on Green Lantern at the time, called me up and needed eight pages for Green Lantern 52. And suddenly I've got, you know, my first printed DC work. Yeah. You know? So I have, I have a question. This is, this is, this is one that you guys might not agree with what I have recommended to comic book school students. So I want you to, you know, tell me what your thoughts are. I, I have expressed to comic book school students, most notably the writers. Again, Jamal, I think your work is evident on the page. Either you've got it on the page or you don't. And you can see you can see progression, but as a writer, I have recommended that writers not necessarily publish and or send out their first work. And I've always recommended wait until you've done a few more. Try to get to the number ten. Get good enough that if you want to go back to one, two, or three, and then rewrite it, eleven is your new number one. Right. But write through your really crappy writing until you get proficient at your work. But don't be so eager to kickstart or send your stuff out to an editor. Tom, I saw you nodding. What What are your thoughts on that? Because well, you also write. That's excellent. I mean, writing should be as important to you or more important to you than getting published. I mean, mm -hmm. 
It's mm. not the purpose of all writing is not to get published, but if it, I think it shows, it shows uh, your targets a great deal of respect if you work on your craft for a while before you before you give it to them. Um, I think that's excellent advice. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't I don't see anything wrong with that. My my whole thing about you know putting something together and sending it out is basically like if you feel like you're at that point where yeah. you can put a project together even if it's one issue of something to to show to be your your showcase. But you know, I don't you know, but I agree, you know, don't send out don't just wake up one morning and decide I'm going to be a comic book writer and then automatically that's going to be the thing that I, I used to know this guy who kept reworking the same script over and over again <laughs> for years. The same issue. Never did anything else. It, it was an wow. idea for a series, but he never got past issue one because he kept rewinding, issue, wanting to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and make it perfect. And he just kind of got stuck there and it never got really, it never really got any better. Oh, the, yeah. I, the idea itself was just kind of lame, that but <laughs> it, it is, sense. but yeah, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing with art. You know, there's, there's a saying amongst pencilers, like you got to get, you know, once you get past your first hundred pages, then you're good. You're wait, say that. Wait, say that again. Your how many pages? Your first hundred pages. Your first hundred pages lot, yeah. are going to suck. Yeah, <laughs> going to absolutely suck. right. But you, because the thing is, you have to get used to working on a schedule. And most beginning cartoonists are working here and there. They're working after. They're doing stuff after work. They're doing stuff after school. They're doing stuff on the weekends. You're not, especially when you're when you're trying to break into a company, a, a mainstream or even an independent company with a regular publishing schedule. You need to be able to produce. And a lot of guys, like I did my first job, I had never drawn a monthly comic book in my life on my first job, and it sucked. And I'm yeah. glad that I never saw print. Yeah. But it gave me that I had like an issue and a half to kind of like work out those kinks before I was able to move on and do something, uh, do something else that was a little bit better and then a little bit better and a little bit better. And eventually there was growth. But again, it's like I was saying to your students last week, you have to be able to open yourself up to experience. You have to be able to open yourself to wanting to try different techniques and try new things. And that was the only way that you, I was going to be able to do it was actually doing the work and actually figuring out what worked for me and what doesn't work for me. You know, instead of it just being a, a, a mishmash of my favorite comic book artists trying to figure out what Jamal Eagle's work looks like. Now, I have a, I have a question for you guys. Um, I've seen this at, at cons. I'm wondering if this is still the case. You get a beautiful portfolio. You look at this person's work. You're like, wow, this is really good. What's the first question you typically ask that person? The first question I usually ask that person. That is, artist who's holding that page. If, if, how long did it take you? That's right. <laughs> and what's the important thing when you answer that question, Jamal? A day. <laughs> no, but what's the important thing the artist needs to know? Tell the, the truth, right? Okay, no, exactly. no, absolutely, absolutely. Tell the truth because there have been so many situations. Not with me personally, thank God, but I've I've had I've heard so many different situations talking to editors where they find this guy at a con. He's fantastic. He's an ex Alex Ross. He's an ex Adam Hughes. He's an ex Jim Lee. They send him a script and they never hear from him again. He just absolutely right. He just disappears off the face of the earth. I, it's a hard job that you do. That is, when you said, I kind of smiled when you said, um, you know, you started doing your first story for a, uh, a monthly comic, and it sucked. And I thought it, I thought you meant the experience sucked. And I was no, like, I yes. sucked. <laughs> yes. I know you meant your work did. You could have said the experience sucked too, because I'll bet it did. It's a lot of work. 
it, it, it is. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's because the thing about putting together a comic book, a comic book page, is you are you're the cinematographer, you're the costume designer, you're the set dresser. You know, if you don't have the the knowledge to be able to put those things together, and because every story has a different feel, every story has a different look. If you tackle every comic book the exact same way, it gets stagnant. You know, you have to find you have to find that thing that makes that story unique, and you do, there's a wealth of knowledge that's attached to that that you're not going to be able to access if you're just jumping into jumping into things so i will fully admit that i did not do like on my first job i did not do half the research that i needed to do because i figured i could just fake it mm -hmm. you know but one of the things that i've learned over the years is that if you're going to do a story you need to invest everything into that story you need to make that world you know to steal a term from richard donner you need that verisimilitude you need that belief that everything in that world exists because you say it does. It doesn't have to be realistic, but a car has to look the way it does in your world because all the cars look that way. You know, a hand looks the way it does because all the hands look that way. All yeah. the faces look that way. It, it has to be a believable reality for the reader because once it deviates from that in any way, shape, or form, the reader automatically gets taken out of the story. You know, and it's very hard to get them back once you take them out of it. I'll say, too, I've never, you've drawn a lot of panels with me, <laughs> working with me, <laughs> and I've looked at all of them. And I'll bet it has to, I mean, it stands to reason that when you drew some of them, you were tired. Mm -hmm. But I would never be able to find those ones in a million years. Part of, the, <laughs> part, of the, part of the job is... If you get tired, you can't let it show. <laughs> no, no, not at all. You got you got to give a uh, hundred percent all the time, and all the time. You do. All the time. You know, and it, if if it means like stepping back for a little bit and and just you know pulling your energy, you know, take an hour, relax, you know, take a walk. You know, I I walk my dog. You know, I you know I I get outside and. You know, I, I separate myself from it and I come back or I take a nap. You know, sometimes you got to take a nap. You know, sometimes you need to need the extra sleep. You know, this, you know, one of the things that gets lost in the creation of any type of artwork, especially commercial art or any type of writing, is that we lose ourselves sometimes. Self-care goes out the window. And you always have to take care of yourself, even just a little bit. You know, self-care is very, very important. Self-care is very important to me. I mean, buddy, you've known me long enough. You know how heavy I used to be, you know. And I think I, you say you go out walking the dogs. I, are you sure you're not lifting the dogs, too? Well, that, too, I, that too. But <laughs> Hey, but so just real quick, and I think it goes to what Jamal was saying, um, and and Tom, you know, again, as 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 an editor working now or a writer now working with on at least three projects with three different artists, um, it's not just drawing the page; it's reputation. Um, we are in a small industry. Everybody, if they don't know everybody directly, they have a way to get to everybody, right? Yeah. Um, how important is reputation? How much consideration do you give when you are thinking about? bringing somebody new uh, into the fold? Oh, it's important. It's important. I'm not saying like, you know, if you mess up once, you'll be blackballed or anything. But if someone, it, I, I once uh, hired a writer to work on a book that every single person, one of, this is when I was at DC. Um, and it, this was a writer I tremendously admired from when I was young and buying comics. And every single person there told me, you are going to have a miserable experience with this person. You are just making yourself unhappy. Don't do it. And I said, but he's great. No, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And I hired him, and he made me so miserable. <laughs> 
The nicest people in comics were warning me against it. Yeah. People who were famous for being nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I can handle this. I could not handle it at all. So I would imagine that gets into the calculus of, of, of who you want to work with when you're thinking about a long-term project, right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of it is, you know, I mean, what's most important is what's on the page. You know, if somebody's a little more work than another person, if what's on the page is great, that's fine. That's fine. But you don't want someone who's, who's going to endanger the schedule endanger the project with lateness endanger the project by disappearing um or just find like emotional ways to make everyone else unhappy uh there's certain things you don't want to experience with people if you can help it i have learned <laughs> okay real quick um we're gonna have some questions coming in from the audience but i did have uh one or two uh additional questions uh, recommendations uh, for other opportunities and other ways to break into comic books. Um, there are some people like me who got in through the journalism way, right? There's that that path has changed a little bit with fan press. Uh, some people get in as colorists or like Jimmy, work their way up through inking and into writing. Um, recommendations for our community and how they can get their foot in the door and work their way up. Find an artist that you admire who might be looking for an assistant. You know, that, you know that's a that's a way to get in. Um, I've had a couple of assistants over the years who've helped me with backgrounds and stuff like that. Who went on and are doing their own work. One of them it took over my class at the Art Students League and has been teaching it for like the last eleven years. Wow. So, yeah, and he's like editing anthologies for the league, and you know he's he's actually working with me on an anthology story that I wrote for. Can you uh, reveal who this is? You're, kill oh, no, You're killing name, me with tension. His, his name is Steve Walker. Okay. And you know he, he can if you're he's very talented. He he goes by the uh, the name uh, the uh, screen name Agent Hush. So. <laughs> So becoming an assistant to Jamal Eigel is a pretty good path to. It, it is a good path. Stepping it, up your, it, okay. There were there are opportunities for that. Um, not with me right now, but <laughs> there's all there, there. That's a good way to get in, you know. And even like even now, like because so much work is being done digitally, you know, there's there's still that opportunity up there. Um, internships are good. Yeah, I know Marvel still offers an internship. I know there are some smaller publishers who are looking for, who occasionally are looking for interns to work with them. Yeah, so you know that's a good another good way to get in on the the editorial end. And and Tom, same question. What 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 might you recommend to someone right now who's looking to make their way into professional comic books? Well, you know, Ahoy is a small company, and we don't have. Um, until we grow, there are not a lot of opportunities to bring people in. Um, uh, th there's just a limit to how many projects we can start. Uh, but I will say that uh, we call them comic magazines because in the back of um, every Ahoy comic, there is a prose short story. There's poetry. They, all of these are illustrated. They take... Um, we have black and white and gray tone illustrations for all of them. Uh, and if it's it's a good way to get known by us. If, uh, if you can write a good prose story, it doesn't necessarily mean that we know you can write a comic book, but uh, it's a step. It's a step in the direction of um, us knowing that you're a real person with it. And you have on your website, and I'll and I'll note this um, that you do have um, submission guidelines. Uh, you you shared a a, a, a wonderful um, guidelines for writers, which we'll be sharing with our community. Um, but I do want to take a minute to, to note something. Somebody just came on audio. I just want to note something. So our community, and you guys know this. We say this at Comic Con every year. Um, these creators come on. They get paid pretty much by the hours they put in. So when Jamal comes in, he's not drawing, Tom is not editing. The way we say thank you to them is we will say thank you to them tonight. Um, but we say thank you by going to the comic shop, pre-ordering, 
and uh, buying their books. Um, the Wrong Earth is available in trade. They are moving into their next collect their next uh, arc. Uh, and going to your store and pre-ordering is how you keep independent comics alive and thriving. If retailers don't see you ordering independent comics, they won't put them on the shelves. So it looks like something's about to spin up here real quick. Up oh, there you go. It's on Amazon mm -hmm. in case uh, in case you wanted to order from home. We always encourage you to order from your local comic shop as well, um, because uh, we want them to pre-order. But you know, with distribution the way it is, you never really know. Um, I am going to ask Erin to jump in, and uh, she's. We're going to take some questions from the audience, Tom and Jamal. I have no idea what the questions will be. I haven't pre-vetted them at all. But for everyone who's in the audience, this is Dee Alley, who is part of our community. She's our editor on our anthology. Dee, why don't you tell us what the first question is? Okay. Uh, the first question is actually from Kevin. Um, he said, when you start out selling comics, what is a good starting price for something like an eight-page comic? Or if we decide to expand our eight-page into something like a standard 22 or 24-page comic? Hmm. A price you would charge readers? That is, mm -hmm. that is open to so many questions because a lot depends on what kind of printing you're using, what kind of paper you're using, is there color? Right. Is, is, it, is it a digital comic? Do you just are you just selling PDFs? I mean, if you want to do it that way, yeah. um, I would say many many prices. I, I I would look at what someone is charging who's doing something just like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Jamal? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I would say just as a for like an eight page comic. Sorry, that's my daughter. She's got allergies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say for like an eight page comic, if you were doing it digitally, I would probably say, you know, 50 cents, maybe 99 cents, somewhere in that range. You don't want to price yourself out. Um, what's the, I know that like Brian Vaughn and Marcos Martin, when they were doing digital comics, they had this sort of like pay whatever you feel is, I forget the name of the, the, the site that they were using, but it's like pay whatever price you want for the, the comic, you know, that, that sort of thing. If people feel like donating more, you know, they could donate more, but you know, I think that's probably a good way to go about it. I also, I also think that, uh, um, I, I, um, I think you have to think about what you're, what you're trying to get out of this. Are you trying right. to earn a living or are you just trying to get your portfolio into Tom and Jamal's hands? In which case you're not going to say to Tom, give me four bucks. You're no. going to, you're <laughs> going to hit it. Right. So I think you have to think about what contextually your goal is. And, and I wouldn't charge anything for an eight page comic, just run it off at Kinko's and hand it out. Well, you know, it's kind of, it's also one of the things, like you said, what, what is your goal? Or, you know, do you want to do a full 22 page story? print it out and sell it you know how much is your creative team getting for it you know how much are you you know what are your your over what's your overhead how much are you printing shipping distribution these things all cost money so okay thanks guys uh next question is from ari what do you look for in a cover letter especially from a creator with whom you are not already familiar a $20 bill tape to the back. <laughs> hey, you said no bribing. Come on. No, Tom said no bribing. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I take bribes. <laughs> Good to know. You know, it's not like it's not like you're applying to work in the insurance industry or anything. It's our shop is pretty informal. I don't think it's not I don't think you need to go to a business book to figure out how to deal with us. We're just, you know, making it up as we go along, just like everybody else. So you can approach us pretty casually. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Ari as well. As an editor, I'm looking for tips about giving feedback to creators. To what extent are you critical, nurturing in your feedback, and does it change at various points in the process? Mm. Yeah, you need to find good things to say along with the bad things you're saying. <laughs> or else there's no point in discouraging someone for life. It's kind of a terrible thing to do. Uh, I will. OK, so my approach has been 
if somebody shows me a portfolio, I always lead with one question, which is, do you want me to be nice or do you want me to be honest? Nice because I can be, because I can be nice. Nine times out of ten, they'll say honest, and then you can really sort of get into the the whole nitty gritty and break down the mechanics of something and tell them why it doesn't work. I had one instance where a young lady. This was, I still remember this. This was like twenty years ago. Um, I was at uh, one of the old, uh, actually longer than that, because it was one of the old Fred Greenberger shows. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah. And so I'm, I'm doing portfolio reviews and this young lady comes up to me and she, you know, she's showing me her work and she's, she's very clearly influenced by ElfQuest. I'm very, very much a fan of Wendy Penny. And I'm looking through the work and it's not strong, but you know, I see a couple of things and I, and I start like trying to explain things for her. And as I'm talking, She's, I see tears start to well up in her eyes. And I'm just in my head, just like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Please don't cry. I'll be nice. I swear to God, I'll be, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be nice. Please don't cry. And, you know, she started crying. And I was like, I'm sorry. It's not bad work. I just, you know, I just. So I, I always try to, when I'm giving a critique, I always try to be, you know, that, that, you know, that, iron fist and a velvet glove, you know, where, you know, I'm going to tell you what I think you need to know, but I'm going to try to do it in the most constructive way possible. I'm not, you know, it's, it does me no good to rip somebody in your butthole and yeah. just, you know, and it doesn't do them any good because then they shut themselves off to other people, to other people's critiques. But when I told you, the uh, premise for the wrong earth. You did make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. Not. I'm so sorry. That was so mean, Jim. Oh, I'm a bastard. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Uh, this question is actually from me. What made you guys want to start Ahoy Comics? And what were some of the big do's and don'ts that you think people should know when becoming a publisher of your own work? Oof. Yeah, uh, our publisher, Hart Seeley, and chief creative officer, Frank Camuso, and I, we all live in Syracuse. We've all been friends for decades, good friends. We've done creative work together. And um, this really came from Hart. He just uh, found the money somehow to launch a company, and he came to us. Because we Hart is a journalist. He really wasn't into comics. But Frank and I were both comic book people. And he just had this idea. I was like, sure, if you find money, I'll do it. And uh, uh, it's been great, you know, just to work, to do this, to just devote yourself to uh, something big with lifelong friends is, 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 has really been great. Um, my, the advice I would give people is to do it in ignorance, because if you know how hard it's going to be, you will not do it. Go in there with as much ignorance as you could possibly muster. <laughs> there are days we've regretted this so much. <laughs> but we're all glad we did it. Cool. Uh, from, from the self-publishing angle also, like my biggest piece of advice is, find, like with the Ahoy guys, find people who you trust who can help you because doing it all by yourself is hard it is really hard one thing we learned early that was a smart decision we made was if, if we could afford it and we needed something done we would bring someone in who actually knew how to do it hmm. and uh that's been a huge help to us instead of trying to simply instead of trying to learn everything ourselves because it just won't get done well if you're doing it that way cool all right. Thanks, guys. Uh, moving on. Uh, this is Rob's question. What are uh, comic books are you guys personal fans of right now? Mm. Oof. A lot, actually. <laughs> I'm put you on the spot. No, no, no. Um, let's see. Um, Immortal Hulk is really, really good. Al Ewing's doing fantastic work on that. I just started picking up uh, Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo's Nightwing run. 
fantastic. Like the best the book has been in a while. Um, but I'm read I'm reading a ton of stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, what else I got? I got New Eternals. Oh. Uh, Next amazing Spider Man. Uh, I gotta, I've been reading this uh, this manga series called DDD Demons DDD Demon Dead. It, 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 it's a very long title. There's like a lot of alliteration yeah. there. It? It's it's a very it's no it's 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 very cool. The the whole premise of it's about these high school girls who are about to graduate, but uh, the world has been invaded by aliens but the aliens don't do anything they just sort of hover in in the sky not really doing much so it's more <laughs> of a slice of life you know manga <laughs> so so you go out and buy comic books i comic i books, i do well you know you take luckily, them home and read them yes i do luckily you know my comic what? shop is three blocks away so what are you a child are you a child <laughs> I feel like one someone sometimes, but you know what I do is I drag my thirteen-year-old with me and use her as an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I like Immortal Hulk too. Really <laughs> Strange Adventures is really good. Yeah, it has that. Yeah, that has. That's another. Uh, that's another. There's, you know, the thing is, is there are so many good comic books out there. It's embarrassing. Like it's just a, an embarrassment of riches right now. It really is. You know, mm -hmm. but I think in general, like the good that this industry has produced over the decades really does outweigh the bad in a lot of ways. Like, you know, I, I think that the, the talent pool right now in this industry is just probably some of the best that's ever produced comics. That's right. Yeah. And Tom, what are you reading? Well, I liked Immortal Hulk and Strange Adventures. There's this guy I follow on Twitter named Ken, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Pareil, P-A-R-I-L-E. Mm -hmm. And he um, routinely finds these insane panels from Golden Age off-brand comics. <laughs> and then I go find the comics online. <laughs> because I have to, because the panels he finds are so insane. <laughs> That's been the bulk of my comics reading the last couple of weeks. Very cool. Okay, uh, moving right along. Uh, the next question is from Chris. Uh, Ahoy has a dark sense of humor, as you mentioned. Is there a humor you avoid or that's off limits? Uh, Chris says he's got a sick sense of humor for potty. He's got a real sick sense of humor, but potty humor, such as fart jokes. Um, is there a right sense of humor or personality? The only thing I don't like is punching down. If you're making fun of someone with less power than you have, then we won't print you, we won't publish you. But other than that, we're pretty open to uh, anything that uh, is not just engineered to make someone feel like they're worse than you are. I think that's what makes something like Billionaire Island work, work really well. So, you know, the, punch, the punch it way up. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> cool. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, this actually came up. I love you, buddy. I do. But sometimes you assume that everyone's a writer and not everyone is. So <laughs> as an artist, I wanted to know, since we had that conversation, you guys said that um, you can tell, you know, if an artist is going to be someone you want to work with like like that. You don't have to spend the time to read the script. But what is it that people are going to show you that's going to make you think that or get, that's going to say this is a person I want to work with? Because I've been to 100 portfolio reviews and everybody's got a different idea. So what is it you guys look for in an artist? Well, you got to you got to have some, we have to see sequential pages, sequential yeah. pages. we got to see panel to panel storytelling. And not just like punching people. You know, no. I need to know that you can draw a conversation in a, in a realistic setting. Or even if it's a fantasy setting, I need to see characters who can emote. I need to see characters who can move in a, a realistic or a naturalistic space, a space, a believable space, you know, because 90, you know, 
90% of what you're going to end up doing in this industry is just going to be conversations taking place at coffee shops. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but you know, my, you know, my approach has always been that everything is about conflict, whether it's a fight or a conversation. So you need to be able to do both. I need to be as, you know, if I were looking for an artist, I need to be able to tell that if I give you a script that you are not going to deviate from said script and go off and do your own thing because you don't like the script and you think you have a better idea. I need to know that not only can you draw well, but you can do it in a timely manner that you can do it at a a pace that I need you to be able to do it at. I need to know that you can communicate with your collaborators, not just, you know, with me as, you know, the de facto editor, but talking to your colorist, talking to your anchor, finding what, you know, or, you know, even if you don't talk to them directly, you know, not being a dick about everything you know mm -hmm. that 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 really is what it comes down to you know yeah be, absolutely. You know, be fast things, you know, be fast be good don't be a dick right <laughs> some of these things you can only find out over time this is true, this is very true. if i'm looking at samples i want to see one thing i've noticed with people who are relatively inexperienced is is too often it seems like the characters are on a stage that's about two feet deep Mm -hmm. And um, it's very, I'd like to see some depth. I'd like to see some perspective on every page. And I'd like to see you draw something hard, like the underside of a car that someone's picking up. I'd like to see you draw something that is not that easy. So not just two characters side by side against a brick wall for the entire right. time. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, yeah. Got it. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question is from Chris. When starting and soliciting your work, is the in, with the intent to be picked up for, sorry, when first starting and soliciting your work, is it with the intent to be picked up for one of their books or is it to have your own book picked up? Is it a primarily, or are you primarily dependent on the publisher? So I think what he's asking for is if, if you're starting out do you think you should solicit your own stuff or should you just use what the publishers are giving to you? I think it depends on your goal, to be honest. I mean, if your goal is to draw for a larger company, if your goal is to draw for an established title, they want to know that you can draw their characters, you know, in, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, there isn't really as much of a, the, the whole house style mentality, although it does sort of kind of creep back into Marvel and DC, depending on whoever like hot artist du jour is. But, you know, they want to know, you know Marvel and DC, Dark Horse, Valiant, you know, image to some extent, they want to know that you can draw their characters. Um, if you're if your goal is to put yourself out there and solicit your own work and get your own work out there, then that's what you should be concentrating on. That's what your pitch should be. You know, if you are, you know, pitching yours, you know, horror series, don't pitch your horror series and say, Hey, I've got these, you know, these Batman samples that you can look at too at the same time, because you're sending conflicting messages. Not every publisher, is looking to hire talent, you know, to just, you know, to help with their brand management. They're looking for new IP to, to exploit, you know, new characters to create, you know, possibly, you know, slap on lunchboxes and, you know, sell to the CW. <laughs> <laughs> One cool. thing about uh, submissions I've been wanting to say, and no, uh, not that anyone's asked, is I think it'd be helpful if you submit to Ahoy. I don't, I can't speak for other companies, but if you send me like 
something that's already written, drawn, lettered, and colored. It brings out like the DeForest Kelly in me. I'm like, I'm an editor, not a printing press. <laughs> so please try to avoid that. Cool. So Dee, I think you had one more question and then we have to go move to wrap, right? Okay. So the last question is, what would you say is the average time in the industry it takes a writer to write an issue, say 20 pages? Uh, the night before it's due. <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to say that. It's a, it's good to have a week to write a comic book. Okay. If you can write five pages a day, that would be good, a good consistent pace. All right. So we thank you to the uh, community for posting your questions. Uh, we have a couple more things to do before we wrap up. Uh, I asked each of our creators uh, to give us one piece of advice that they wish they had gotten early in their career. So Dee, can you pull up Jamal's pro tip? Jamal, you wanna read this out loud for us? Sure. What's the one thing you wish someone had told you early in your career? But being the best is a losing proposition. It's not about being the best artist, but being the best version of yourself as an artist and as a person. Right on. That's a, that is a great tip. And um, Tom, take a deep breath. You're gonna have to read yours as well. Do you wanna pull up Tom's? It's a pretty long one as well. I think so. Relax. <laughs> I wish someone had said that to me early in my career. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's some great advice uh, from both of you. And um, uh, so as we've told our community, uh, we want them to keep an eye out for things that are coming from Ahoy. I think Penultiman is uh, in the queue as well. Tom, you wanted to just talk about that a little bit, tell people about uh, what's coming up. Yeah, the trade paperback is coming out soon. Um, should be within a couple of weeks. I should know the date. If I were a professional, I would be able to tell you. Um, but it's our comic, a comic I did with Alan Robinson, who's a terrific artist. It's a great high concept. Can you just explain it real quick? It's, ba it's basically if the most admired, most powerful, most charming, most terrific superhero in the world secretly hated himself. And uh, he's got a uh, robot sidekick who's trying to fix him. Such a great high concept. Um, what else should they be looking out for? And, and should they be pre-ordering? No, wait, they're out on the stands night and day, right? Wrong Earth night and day is running right now. Uh, Are you able to pull that up, D? Uh, I don't have that one. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's um, wrong we'll, Earth. We'll get the link and put it in the form chat. Yeah, it's the Wrong Earth series uh, that, that Jamal and Tom are working on. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's the second series of it. And uh, it's got a different status quo where the, uh, the two heroes actually meet each other. And last but certainly not least, uh, the uh, Ahoy team produces a newsletter. Um, so uh, if you want to keep up and know what Ahoy is working on to keep uh, your finger on the pulse, uh, you should definitely subscribe to their newsletter. How much do you charge per month for that newsletter, Tom? That's zero dollars and zero cents. That is a heck of a deal. Um, so I think we lost Jamal. Hopefully he dials uh, back in. Uh, so. Uh, but Tom, um, where can they find you? It looks like you may even have your Twitter handles in your bio right there. Where can they find you? Right up there, yeah, at Tom Pyre. And the company's Twitter feed is at Ahoy Comic Mags. And, and they should keep an eye out for all things Tom Pyre, including your future upcoming appearance here at Comic Book School announced right here and now. Uh, just like Jamal uh, did a, uh, a, a very deep dive in a script. Tom, we will be doing a deep dive in the first issue script for The Wrong Earth and having you explain it in real time, almost like an annotated script, but explain it in real time, side by side with the art in an upcoming episode. Great, I look forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be great. And I do, I do want to uh, pull up one thing of nostalgia. Dee, can you pull up that wizard photo that I just sent over <laughs> before the show? Uh, this, is, yeah, this is where I met Tom. It was uh, oh so many years ago, wizard number 62. I don't know what year that was, Tom, but um, well, there you are. 
Wait, which one are you? I have to know. I can't see it very well. I can't find myself. Oh, you know, blue shirt and shorts here. And no shoes on Short in bag. Manhattan. Yeah you, yeah, you took your shoes off I to be Paul, Paul in the Abbey, Abbey Road crossing there. We tried to imitate Abbey Road. There was far too many people, and it was in Manhattan Midtown, and Tom kicked off his shoes and walked across the street barefoot for the Who's photo. That? Right. You yeah. have to. You have to do that. <laughs> Who's in the white shirt? Okay, you want to pull that back up? So that's Fabian. So that's Mark Wade. It is Fabian. Fabian looks like Donald Trump Jr. in this photo. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kevin McGuire, then Kurt, then yep. Priest, um, then then you, then Kaminsky. And I actually can't see who's behind Kaminsky, Len Kaminsky. Is that Don? I, you know, I don't. Honestly, don't know. I, I, it might be able to e easier if I if I had a gotten a better photo of it. It's literally I took a photo of the magazine spread. That was very high tech of me, wasn't it? <laughs> um, but uh, that was the last time I saw Tom in person up until now, and neither of us yeah. changed a bit, right, Tom? We're yeah. I want to no, we haven't changed at all. I want to say that it was ninety five or six, right? I would say it was yeah. I would say it was right around that time, and then uh, Valiant was uh, Fabian was put in charge of rebirthing the Valiant universe with you guys, and that was actually where I discovered your writing. You were doing Magnus, and I thought it was really good. Like it, like Magnus was a tough character. I thought to write, and it was, um, it was one of those gold keys. And I thought you did a really good job of dimensionalizing the character and that weird golden age situation that became Valiant and whatever. And that was how I discovered your writing. Thanks. Thanks. I was lucky to have uh, Mike McCone drawing it. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and as I was telling Dee, at some point, uh, we're going to start publishing that. I recorded that for, I think you guys are there for two days. We videotaped it. And we have these long conversations about the Valiant Universe with you guys. And it's, uh, I, I think, probably four hours of tape. So Crazy. So yeah. much backlog of YouTube videos to come. So much to come. <laughs> and Jamal, we were just talking about where people can find and follow Tom. Where can they find and follow you? Uh, mostly on Twitter at Jamal Eigel, um, but I'm also on Facebook. And you can follow me. You can find me at my website, which is jamaleigel.com. And uh, you can email me from there. And I try to answer emails. I'm not always successful at it, but I try. <laughs> And Jamal, thank you so much for last week. Uh, Tom, we look forward to uh, scheduling you for the future. D, great job engineering. And thank you guys so much for sharing your time so generously with our community. And we hope that someone within our community actually sends you something that's awesome that you're excited about. And eventually uh, they become, uh, you, you help them launch their career. Um, but otherwise you've given out such wonderful advice tonight. I can, I can only call this a resounding success. Thank you guys so much for joining us here at Comic Book School. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. It was fun. Good night, everybody. Thank you.